There was once a young man who was raised by a Jewish mother and a non-Jewish father. He was raised with really no connection to Judaism at all. Not even Hanukkah, not even Passover. But he was raised in a loving home, in a beautiful home, and he was a great student. He was an excellent student. He particularly excelled in all sorts of art, but particularly of all the arts he excelled in, it was actually cuisine, cooking, that he really, really took off with. And instead of going to college, he decided to move to New York and make his way in the world of haute cuisine. And he found his way into a top restaurant with one of the top chefs in the city. He begged and pleaded and he promised he would do absolutely anything if they would just let him work for this restaurant. Well, they got, he got the job. He got the job and he had to do, well, the worst stuff you anybody would ever want to do or had, would have to do in a restaurant. He had to clean the grease traps. He had to take out the trash over and over. He had to scrub the floors. Really nasty stuff. Well, in the process of what he was doing, he noticed after the first few nights that there was quite a bit of good food that he was having to throw out. And he went and asked, and he said, are you sure this is to be thrown out? And they said, yes, once it's back here, we can't use it, and we can't sell it, and we can't give it away. And so he did it, but after a few more nights, and of course he was living in a pretty poor part of town, there were lots of people out there who were homeless. And he decided to ask his manager if perhaps it would be all right <clears throat> if there was no connection whatsoever back to the restaurant. Could he take the food and deliver it, hand it out to people who are hungry and in need? And the manager hemmed and hawed. He said, fine. Just don't let me hear about it. I don't want to know about it. So that's what he did. In the first night, the first few nights, he brought the food back near where he lived and he started handing it out to different people who were living on the street, different people who were hungry, and he built a relationship with them over even just a few nights. But starting on that first night, he noticed that this one man, maybe 30 yards away from where he had set up a table, that one man was standing there with his arms crossed with a dour expression on his face, and he wouldn't stop looking at the man, but he wouldn't at all approach. And finally, after the fifth or sixth night, this young man decided, I'm going to go up to him. So he took some of this really delicious food, brought it over to this man standing there with his arms crossed, with a dour expression on his face, and offered it to him. And the man said, and then didn't say anything at all. He wouldn't, he wouldn't even take it. He wouldn't even change his expression. And the young man said, what, what's the problem? And this homeless man, with a dour expression, he said to him, I will never eat food given to me by a Jew. A Jew? You think I'm... I'm a Jew? I mean, okay, technically, okay, yeah, I'm a Jew, but why, what does that have to do with anything? And the man said, only a Jew would look at the world and see hungry people and go out and try to feed them. You know, it's kind of a romantic notion. The idea that our pintalayid, the point of Jewishness in every Jew, cannot be erased. You know, in Jewish tradition, when 
a Jew converts out of Judaism, he actually can't, according to the rabbis. It's actually impossible. According to the rabbis, physically, according to the laws of nature, a Jew cannot be anything other than a Jew. The worst you could say about him is he's not a very good Jew. Or maybe you could say he's a bad Jew. But you cannot say that he isn't a Jew. And this idea that you cannot extinguish the Jewish presence is alluring in a certain way. It gives us hope for the future. That despite challenges and circumstances, despite all the worries and concerns about the future of the Jewish people, Judaism will survive because you cannot rid it from a Jew. On the negative side, though, this is the core of the worst of anti-Semitism. This is exactly what has led to the slaughter and persecution of thousands upon thousands and millions of Jews throughout history. Up until about the Inquisition in the 15th century, it was enough to convert out of Judaism. As long as you weren't affirming Judaism, we'll give you the right, the privilege to live. And the truth is, lots of our brethren chose that route. But in 149, well, in about in 1492, please join me, in 1492, sailed the ocean blue. And the part that we didn't see was, and they killed, the, they, they, they kicked the Jews out too. Now, they didn't kick all of them out. Some of them they forcibly converted. But one of the things that happened is the crown changed its mind. About a generation in, they said, you can't trust the converts. You can't trust those former Jews. And so then it created a whole new understanding of Jewish identity such that you cannot rid the Jew of his Jewishness. The only way you can solve this is through ridding the world of Jews. Now, Jews have been a problem First and foremost, for Christianity. Now, keep in mind, some of my best friends are Christian. This is not to paint all of Christianity today in a negative light. But we Jews, we're stubborn. On Rosh Hashanah, we read it, and we will read it again. What are we? We're stiff necked, right? We're stubborn. This is an essential feature of what it means to be Jewish. So the Christians came along and they re tried to rewrite Jewish history. But we are still here. And we're still insisting, not that they're wrong, but that we're still right, at least for us. They want to call the Bible the New Testament but there is nothing old about ours. They want to talk about the, 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 the shift in, in historical time to now B.C. and A.D. We Jews insist, well, we'll go along to get along, but we're going to call it B.C.E. and C.E. before the Common Era and Common Era. Now, when I was a kid, it took me years to learn that it wasn't before the common error. 
That's another story for another sermon. But we Jews are an ex- have been an existential problem to Christianity. But even more so, we Jews have presented an existential problem to any leader, to any philosophy, to any understanding of the world that seeks to be ubiquitous, that seeks to be the only and the number one. But what do we Jews do? Well, as we've been talking a moment, like Mordechai, we won't bow down. We're about to chant the Kol Nidre prayer. Now, the Kol Nidre prayer is an odd prayer, truly. In the words of Kol Nidre, we basically are going to say, God, all those vows and promises, all those oaths, all those things that we're going to swear to do, we're going to still attempt to do them. We're going to still promise to do them. But we'd like some advanced forgiveness. We'd like an advance on your forgiveness. Let us be forgiven now for the way we're going to mess up later. Not if we mess up, we're going to mess up. All right? So that's what the Kol Nidre prayer is about. And it's a strange text. And there are, all, there are probably as many interpretations of what it truly means, it actually means, as there may be, as there are rabbis. But one of the most common understandings, and one I've taught about, is this notion that it's an expression of humility. That we, what we are saying to God is, we are standing here in this moment and recognizing that we are imperfect that we will not get it right. And that we are not going to measure ourselves by perfection. So could you just give us the benefit of the doubt? We still have to engage in teshuva. We still have to try to fix what we've broken. We still have to work on the relationships. There's a big distinction between the, the uh, oaths that we make to God and the oaths that we make to other people. But we're trying to get an advance on the forgiveness. However, there is another historical understanding of Kol Nidre that we have to ponder. And that is that living as Jews throughout history, we have continually been put in positions by which we couldn't fulfill our vows, by which we were threatened with violence if we fulfilled our vows. And our enemies, they've always understood this. Our enemies have understood Judaism in powerful ways that have really worked to effectively corner us and surprise us. Think about the story of Hanukkah. The Syrian Greeks, what did they do? They took over the ancient temple. But not only did they take over the ancient temple, they desecrated the temple. They knocked over the pillars and the altars and the menorahs, and they just just destroyed everything in there. But they didn't do just that. What else did they do? They ran pigs through the temple. Why? Why? We know why. Because our sacred texts say you can't eat chazer. You can't eat pork. And so they ran them through because this would be of an, a bitter, bitter attack. There were these things called medieval disputations. If any of you have ever read anything about uh, medieval history, and particularly about Jewish medieval history, you'll know that the church regularly challenged the Jewish community in towns all over Europe, and they would bring the chief rabbi of the community, 
before generally the archbishop of the town, and they would have a disputation. They'd have an argument to try to prove who was right, Judaism or Christianity. Has the Messiah come or he hasn't come yet? Generally, the Jews won. But they never won because it was fixed from the beginning. You know that, that poem that we pray on Rosh Hashanah morning and Yom Kippur morning? Right, the one that, we, that many of us uh, find really difficult, Unatana Tokev, the words that say who shall live and who shall die, who by fire and who by water. The tradition teaches, the legend teaches, that those words came spontaneously forth from Rabbi Amnon of Mainz, who had been at a disputation and who had over and over and over again denied the credibility of the archbishop, but on this particular moment, he was tired. He was stressed. He said, could you give me like three days and I'll get back to you. But that alone made him just so distraught because he recognized that he allowed for the possibility that the Christians would think that he would doubt the veracity of Jewish tradition. And he didn't come after three days. And finally, he was forced by guards, brought to the archbishop. Then Rabbi Amnon of Mainz said, I have doubted my tradition. Even momentarily, my tongue should be removed from me. And the archbishop said, no. Your feet and your hands will be. And then the tradition is that he was brought before the ark right before the Kedusha on Rosh Hashanah, and he shared these words of Unetana Tokef. It doesn't matter if, the, if this is a legend. It was based in what happened to Jews throughout the centuries. Fast forward to Nazi-controlled Europe where the Holocaust could never have happened were it not for Christian anti-Semitism. The Nazis, they appreciated Jewish history. They actually studied it. Goebbels, Goebbels had what he called the Goebbels calendar. And this was a calendar that he would use to assign dates for terrible attacks and transports of Jews. The Warsaw Ghetto was emptied on, as we say in Hebrew, davka, of all times, of all places, on Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, the date that we understand is the date of the destructions of the first and second temple. Goebbels had a particular fondness for Purim, so at the end of the story of Purim, of, of the story, at the end of the story of Esther, uh, Haman and his ten sons were hung from gallows built in the streets of Shushan. Goebbels and other Nazi officials would have what they called Purim fests, where they would do the same to Jews in revenge for what the Jews did to the Persians in this legendary tale thousands of years earlier. It happened in the Zudunska Wola concentration camp. They called it the Purim prank. The editor of Der Sturmer on the day after Kristallnacht justified the violence against the Jews because of his claim that it was in revenge for the 75,000 Persians killed in the story of Esther. Hitler, in his own writings, in his own words, identified with Haman. Kol Nidre is a prayer written for Jews at the beginning of the year because they knew they weren't in control of their own lives. Even in the best of times, they are brought in to serve a necessary purpose. 
in medieval towns where they'd be brought in to, uh, to provide finance, business. One of the only occupations we were allowed to engage in. At a moment's, at a, but at a moment's notice, they'd be run out on a rail. In the past couple of years, as you know, there's been a huge growth of anti-Semitism throughout the word, world. And we Jews are still a target. We are the ones upon whom blame was too easily placed. And yet, we have become complacent in that knowledge. Not about religion or tradition necessarily, but about our history. Not enough people I speak with, not enough people in the Jewish community know about the blood libel. The blood libel, in case you don't know, was another attack on the Jews during medieval periods, during Passover. Jews were accused of kidnapping Christian children and using their blood to make matzah. And they would go so far as to describe, you know, the ridges on a piece of matzah. If you're at all familiar with medieval history, there was something called the iron comb. It was a, you can imagine what it was. And they said that that's what the Jews would do to create those ridges on the matzah and on the bodies. The protocols for the elders of Zion. Not enough of the Jewish world remembers, knows what those are. They were faked histories, faked uh, testimonies of Jews who were planning the domination of the world. And this book was brought to the United States by Henry Ford. This book has been translated into 70 languages and is still published throughout the world. And I say all of this to you tonight to ask the question, why would a Muslim man of Pakistani descent fly 5,000 miles from London to Dallas and head to the synagogue that was the closest to the federal prison in Fort Worth, Texas in a little town called Colleyville. Because he was there to rescue Afia Sadiqi, a Pakistani neuroscientist who was convicted in 2010 for attempting to kill U.S. Army officers during inter an interrogation in Afghanistan two years earlier. Why would he go to the rabbi of Colleyville and then demand to speak to the grand rabbi of the United States of America, my colleague and friend, Rabbi Angela Buckdahl? He demanded, that was his first question, I must speak with Rabbi Buckdahl. Well, as Willie Sutton is said to have replied when he was asked, why do you rob banks? He said, well, that's where the money's at. Well, the question for this young man, why did you ask the rabbi in Colleyville or in New York to free your friend? Because his worldview with which he was raised, told him, the Jews, the synagogue in America, that's where the power's at. Why would the Proud Boys scream, Jews will not replace us? Why can we even imagine a homeless man refusing gourmet food because he won't touch it? from the hand of a Jew. And let's be honest here. Where in the world would fringe nutballs get the notion of Pizzagate? P 
Pizzagate is that horrific accusation that leaders high up in the Democratic Party are kidnapping children and using their blood for adrenochrome, some fictionalized solution that is supposed to make one young. That's just recycled blood libel. And it's just recycled anti-Semitism. And why am I talking about this tonight? Because you're here. Because more of our Jewish community needs to be reminded that while we Jews are in a much better place today despite the rise of anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism is real. And at times it feels like it's in the water and in the air. We cannot let anti-Semitism surprise us. And so this is the oath that I am encouraging you to take upon yourself tonight. Let us not be surprised by the reality of anti-Semitism, by its endurance, that it is so well-rooted. There are many people who are acting anti-Semitically who don't realize that they are. The very act of not tolerating the minority voice in society and persecuting it and marginalizing it is the roots of anti-Semitism. And we have got to become more aware and sensitive to it. Not declaring that it happens everywhere, not accusing everyone, but understanding its roots. Rabbi Ed Feinstein wrote in the Chutzpah Imperative, Haman is evil. Evil is the worship of the self above all else. The insatiable drive to aggrandize the self. Evil is ready to destroy anything it casts a shadow over the self. Because the Jewish people have always been the outlier. The visible exception to someone's dream of universal dominion and uniformity of opinion. They have been evil's most enduring victim. Throughout history, the presence of the Jew always compromises someone's fantasy of ubiquitous authority. Haman was only the first to be irritated by Jews' presumptuous refusal to bow down. But the Jew, as it has been said, is only the canary in the mine. The Jew represents all who would stand in the face of authority and demand a place, a voice, a vote for those who are different. And the Hamans of the world always react the same way. For evil to prevail, it must find its way to power. Haman approaches Ahasuerus with his plan. Into his mouth, the book of Esther puts the historically classic soliloquy of hate. Haman then said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the other peoples in all the provinces of your realm, whose laws are different from those of any other people, and who do not obey the king's laws, and it is not in your majesty's interest to tolerate them. Jewish history. Summed up in a few sentences. Those who hate us, hate us because of what we represent. The, no matter where we live or how we live, rich or poor, landed or homeless, academics or unschooled, our very texts 
and observances observe, affirm one thing above all else. There is no idea or philosophy or ruler or city or kind of person that enjoys full and complete recognition other than God. And from that comes a dynamic and challenging and engaging and often something that doesn't provide clear closure. We're good with two ideas. And they can compete. And that is our legacy. We Jews make things complicated. But that is also where we find the glimmers of truth. And more importantly, that is where we live our lives with integrity and grace. In just a moment, we are going to pray together the words of Kol Nidre, in which we will ask God, please forgive us for the things we are going to promise to do and fail at. I promise you, if you set your eyes on becoming more aware of anti-Semitism, if you set your eyes on understanding it, pick up a history book, start really digging in a little bit to really understand these seminal moments that have established anti-Semitism for the centuries, you will still fail because it is so endemic in our society. But it cannot do the worst harm if we can see it coming. We must open our eyes and pledge to be more aware, to understand this history so that we can prevent it from happening to us and to all those who seek to stand up for themselves and for others.